In this episode, I'm joined by Tupton Punstock, a Buddhist teacher who, after 21 years as a monk in the Galugpa order, disrobed to live the life of a layperson in New York City. Punstock describes his childhood in Haiti and the awakening of his desire to become Christ-like and to dedicate his life to spiritual contemplation. Punsok shares his subsequent explorations in Western esotericism, Indian yoga, and Tibetan Buddhism, including studies under Rata Rinpoche and Geshe Lobsang Tarchin. Punstock also shares his views on the dysfunction of modern sexuality, the scholastic emphasis of his Galukpa training, the six yogas of Naropa, and reveals the surprising reasons why, after two decades, he chose to leave the monastic life behind. So, without further ado, Tupton Punstock. Tupton Foodstock, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Well, I'm very delighted to be talking with you today. And uh, you've had a remarkable life, actually. And I hope that we can get into many of the details of your of your life and, uh, and training and path in this interview. But let's begin, if you wouldn't mind, with your early life, your childhood in Haiti. From what I understand, even from a very young age, you had priestly leanings. Would that be fair to say? <laughs> Who have you been talking to? <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, from a very early age, uh, actually, uh, I remembered throwing the sheets, putting the sheets on, on, on me as if they were robes. I remember that I was in Haiti. And uh, the only model that I had were the Catholic priests. So I thought maybe that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a Catholic priest. Uh, I remembered one incident, uh, the first time I actually felt guilty for having done something. And I thought, ah, an opportunity to go to confession. I don't remember how old I was, maybe maybe seven or six around that age. And uh, it, it was everyone in the neighborhood, every boy in the neighborhood, we would uh, ah, we'd do hunting. And what we would hunt were birds. And uh, I thought I would try my luck at doing the same thing. But when I hit the bird, immediately I felt such regret, such horror for what I have done. And immediately I thought, ah, I need to go come to confession. And I went to see the priest. And I told the priest, I've seen a great sin. And he said, ah, oh, well, what have you done? And I said, I killed a bird. And the priest was very shocked. And he said, you haven't done anything wrong, go home. Even though the priest told me that it was okay, still deep within me, I felt, no, I did something wrong. Um, so I had a very, you could say, uh, inspiring, I was very inspired by the story of Jesus Christ, his compassion and his love at uh, the very early age. Yeah. So I grew up, you could say being inspired by Jesus and wanting to become Jesus. <laughs> so I'm curious why it was that you didn't pursue that to become a Catholic priest, for example, given that you were raised in that Catholic context. What prevented that or, or why didn't that come to pass? Uh, I was really interested in Christianity and the only Christianity that I knew at the time was Catholicism because I was that's what I was raised in. and. Almost everyone I knew, there were Catholics. But what I wanted from Catholicism, what I wanted from Christianity was, how do I become Jesus? That was, that was, that was my main thing. No, you're not, you cannot become Jesus. You can only follow him. You can only uh, worship him. But I was, really, I was really wanting to become Jesus. So I was looking, I thought, ah, there must be some teaching in there that teaches you how to become Jesus. It was not finding exactly how to become Jesus teachings within the, at least within the Christianity that I was taught. That's why I didn't really pursue it because I thought the priests were Jesus-like, Christ-like. I thought there were people who became Jesus and Jesus-like immediately at some time. But uh, that was the main reason. Yeah, I didn't pursue that line of career. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Do you think that if you'd encountered the more contemplative aspects of, say, Catholicism 
of which yeah. there are, of course, contemplative orders and, and streams. Uh, if you had encountered something like that, say like a Thomas Merton or this sort of thing, who himself, of course, was very interested in his later part of his life in Tibetan Buddhism, actually, as, as you know, I'm sure. Um, do you think that that might have, you may have become a Christian contemplative, or do you think not the case? Actually, uh, as you, yeah, when you come to think of it, if I had encountered that form of Christianity earlier on, I would have become a Christian contemplative. Yeah, definitely. There's something uh, alluring to me about later on when I found out about them, there was something very alluring about that life. Yeah. What was that? Uh, solitude, the quiet, and the life dedicated to contemplation. And I would say they have a different approach. I think they are trying to become Christ-like, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. That solitary, uh, quiet, contemplative approach, uh, presumably not quite your experience in uh, Buddhist monasticism. Would that be fair to say? <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Could you take us from that time in Haiti up to when you met your first teacher, Radha Rinpoche, and all that proceeded after that? Yes. Uh, my uh, family left Haiti. Uh, first, my father left, and then my mother left. And then I left with my two sisters. I have a, um, a younger and an older sister. Uh, we arrived here when I was nine to the United States. Uh, I spent most of my time in the library reading books, reading uh, Western philosophy, reading uh, theology, different ideas about God. Uh, and, and once in a while, I would uh, read uh, Asian, West, Eastern philosophies. And I noticed that what, what I would call my inner, deeper sense of, ah, this is what sits with me, this is what seems right to me, was more leaning towards the Eastern philosophies. Uh, Taoism, especially Hinduism, I spent a long time studying and reading Hinduism. I even went to... I studied a little bit with the uh, Swami Rama Institute. Uh, but still there was that urge earlier on wanting to become Jesus-like that was still with me. That seems to be a possibility. But it wasn't until I started to read about uh, uh, Buddhism that I start to say, ah, I think they have the teachings on how to become Jesus. And I started to uh, read more about that. Then towards high school, towards the end of high school, that's when uh, I, I was reading more and more Buddhist books, more and more Buddhist books, and there were practices. I even read very early on, I, and later on I, I found out that I should not have read that book so early. <laughs> Evans Wen's book on those incredible yogas. <laughs> you're only supposed to know about after a certain initiation, but I read them already, and I was really interested in that. <laughs> um, but at the end, or somewhere, there was a kind of a warning. You cannot do these practices well unless you have a teacher. And I started looking for a teacher. Where do you find a teacher? I've never, I've never met a Tibetan teacher before. The only, the closest thing that I've ever encountered that uh, to a, a Buddhist teacher were the the Shaolin monks that I saw in movies doing those crazy things. <laughs> Where do you find such a thing? Uh, then, um, strangely enough, I don't know if anybody here remember, there was this thing, uh, in, thing called Yellow Book. It was uh, a directory of names and businesses and things like that. So I looked in the directory. <laughs> Where do I find a Buddhist temple or Buddhist teacher? And strangely enough, through the Yellow Book, I encountered my first teacher. His, uh, his, uh, his temple was listed Tibetan Buddhist and it was in Chinatown in, in Manhattan. And I went there and uh, it became my first formal uh, Buddhist teacher. And I wasn't really looking for Tibetan Buddhism for, uh, per se. I was just looking for any Buddhist teacher. And it happened to run into Rato Rinpoche. Yeah. And I studied with him for quite some time. Mm. Yeah. 
Very interesting. I'm curious, you've said it a few times, becoming Jesus or becoming Christ-like, mm -hmm. and that you, you had an, a, an intuition that something in what you were reading of the Buddhist books might have some way of enabling that. What did that mean to you at that time, Christ-like? If, if back in those days, if we could have asked you in that library, what do you mean by Christ-like or becoming like Jesus? What sort of qualities are you imagining? Mm -hmm. And what was, the, what was the deficit or shortfall between where you were and where Jesus was? Mm -hmm. um, the capacity to love everyone without any hesitation. That was the main thing. And then a life, a life was dedicated to the service of others, completely, 100% dedicated to the service of others. That was the thing about Jesus that I saw, that I wanted to be also. And uh, I, I saw a lot of suffering around me, and I thought this was the best way to help them. And strangely enough, okay, here's a strange story from what you might call the mythology that I've heard about Jesus and Satan and all that kind of stuff. And I accepted it as real at, at, my, at, uh, at, the, at that age when I first encountered it. And I thought, why, why do people suffer? And the, reason, the answer that I was given was, people suffer because Satan makes them, makes them uh, causes them to suffer. And I, and I thought, how can I stop Satan from harming people, from making people suffer? And I thought that if I was as pure as Jesus, I could offer myself as a sacrifice to Satan. And Satan would spend the rest of eternity trying to, uh, trying to turn me, trying to make me into an impure person. But I will be so dedicated to my purity because I know it's, that's the key for people not to suffer anymore. I would just spend the rest of my eternity with Satan trying to tempt me, trying to torture me, trying to make me into, so that it would be, you could say, trying to make me impure would be too much of a distraction for Satan. <laughs> and he would have left people alone and people would not suffer anymore. So there was this uh, wanting to put an end to people's suffering. And I saw from stories that I've heard about Jesus that that was, if I became like Jesus, this is what I would do with my ability. I would distract Satan so he could leave people alone. <laughs> oh, remarkable. That's a very Christian idea. Yeah. <laughs> that sort of offering oneself on the cross, almost. Um, also, perhaps reminiscent a bit of practices like Tonglen. Yeah. Do you see a link uh, there at all? Yes. Uh, strangely enough, it wasn't until uh, I, uh, until I started to study Buddhism, uh, the different practices in Buddhism, Tonglen, that I started to realize, wait a minute, I think I used to do that. Way back then, when I was a little, uh, a little boy, a little child, I would imagine myself Okay, now I have accomplished my, I have accomplished it. I've become very Jesus-like. I would imagine myself going to the, going to hell, and I would see myself offering myself to the devil, and I'll say, okay, now you can let beings go, because now you have me. So it was a kind of a tonglen, I would say, an exchange. I give myself up for others so that they can be free of, uh, of suffering. Mm, fascinating. And I believe you studied with Rato Rinpoche for eight years. Yes. And uh, I'm wondering, uh, what were you doing otherwise at that time in your life whilst you were studying with him? And uh, what sort of things did you study with him? And what sort of a man was he? Oh, my goodness. Uh, how do I begin? Well, <laughs> it was a very interesting uh, setup, first of all. Uh, it, it was not so formal, uh, not so formal. It's not that I was uh, familiar with how these classes would be set up, but it was only later on when I would when I would go to other teachers in their temples in their centers that I noticed that there was very there was this very formal kind of setting. Hmm. At Rafael Mbuche's center, there were chairs. People sat on chairs, and people a few people 
maybe five people would sit on, on the floor on, on cushions. And there was a, people just went in and sat. It wasn't a formal thing like, okay, everybody is coming, okay, everybody stands up, everybody's, everybody bow. There wasn't none of that. There was no formality. And Russell Rinpoche spoke English, but he had such a raspy voice when he was speaking English that he needed a translator. <laughs> So someone was translating Rato uh, English to the rest of the audience because his voice was so raspy and people, people would not be able to recognize it. Uh, you could say with Rato Rinpoche, I studied the sutras. Uh, we spent a lot of time studying Lam Rim. We spent a lot of time especially studying the eight verses of my training. And we memorized that and would uh, recite that uh, uh, every time we would meet. Uh, with Rato Rinpoche, uh, I felt very relatable with Rato Rinpoche. I feel like I can just go to him and, and, and relate with him and ask him questions. Uh, he had such humility. I mean, he's the fourth, uh, the, was it the, 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 the eighth Kyongla, something like that, or the ninth Kyongla of this very, very important monastery, a mon monastery, like all the Gelugpa monasteries look towards this monastery for logic and reason, which is a very big thing with, uh, with, with the Gelugpa uh, tradition. And the, here is the abbot of, of this monastery. And then he could give up his robe at the, by, by that time, by the time I met him, he was already a, a lay person. Yeah, so I was very impressed by his humility. Yeah. And what were you doing at that time? Uh, were you working and so on? Yes, I was working. Uh, I was working. I was uh, finishing my, my degree in <laughs> marketing. <laughs> I didn't choose marketing because I said, oh, I want marketing because I, was, I have to go to school. The only thing I want to do is really is uh, how to become Jesus. <laughs> that's, that's not a career. Uh, so I said, any, any, many more catch a major by the toe. And that's how I ended up with marketing. And I was doing that. Uh, at the same time, also, I was also studying uh, with the Himalayan Institute. Ah, there were a lot of things happening at the same time. I was studying with the Himalayan Institute. So that was my uh, sort of uh, somewhat formal uh, teachings with the Hinduism. But I wasn't really... It wasn't Hinduism following a Hindu tradition, but rather Hinduism in general. And there were the Swami Arma tradition had a very deep respect for Buddhism. And I, as a matter of fact, I, he actually studied with Tibetan Buddhist masters. Uh, and at the same time, this is for some of some of you people may know or may not know. Uh, at a very early age, I was always asking my father questions about the nature of reality and things like that. And fortunately for me, my father was very encouraging of my questioning and he would try to answer or he would direct me to a book. It was through him that I became very familiar with Western uh, philosophies. And also through my father, uh, at the age of 16, I became a member of a Western mystical society called the Rosicrucian Order. And I was a member with them until way late. I didn't, I didn't officially leave, but when I became more and more involved in Buddhism, I sort of uh, slowly stepped away from it. Yeah. So that's what I was doing while I was studying with Rato Rinpoche. I was doing work study at the Himalayan Institute, East West Books, studying yoga, studying Hindu philosophy. And with my somewhat personal family life, my father hang out at the uh, Rosicrucian temple every Sunday and we would study Western mysticism, which was really uh, taking the different wisdoms from different traditions from different parts of the world and sort of combining them, combining them within a Christian Western context. Very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and th uh, this would have been, I guess, the late 80s, Early 90s, is that yeah. right? Yes, late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. Oh, wow, fascinating. How was it that you met, who would later become your heart teacher, Geshe Lobsang Tarching? Uh, at 
Chona uh, Chona Rato Zimbache's uh, uh, center. I met a very good friend of mine there. Somebody who became a very good friend of mine. Said it's Michael Wick. Uh, I don't know how uh, I kept talking about a particular initiation that I wanted to take. And uh, and my friend Michael Wick told me, ah. Ratu Mbache is not my real teacher. My real teacher is uh, Geshe Lusan Tachin, and he has a center in New Jersey, and he's giving that initiation. Why don't you come? So through that, I went to, uh, to New Jersey, and this was a complete contrast to the setting of uh, uh, Chona uh, uh center, or there was completely complete formality. There were maybe uh, in Rato, at Rato's center, maybe there were five cushions. At Rinpoche's center, maybe there were five chairs. <laughs> Everyone sat on the floor. Uh, there was always a start time, maybe, maybe uh, eight o'clock in the morning or nine o'clock in the morning, but there was never really an end time. <laughs> it was whenever Rinpoche felt tired. <laughs> and I would go on for hours and hours and hours. Uh, and after I uh, met met uh, Geshe Losan Tarchin Rinpoche from now on, after I met him, I just felt a connection with him that even though I didn't quite know at the time this thing about having a root guru, having a root lama, but I felt a connection with him that this is the person I should be studying with. And I just and started to spend more to spend more time with uh, Rinpoche in New Jersey because he was teaching. He, uh, I got into the path of Tantra through him. With Rato Rinpoche, he would invite teachers, and they would like uh, not not initiations where you have uh, life commitments. But you know, for more for blessings, he would get. Uh, he would invite teachers like Ladhi Rinpoche and um, uh, oh, so many teachers. There was one teacher I forgot his name, but he was the runner-up to being the Dalai Lama. It, was, it wasn't just one person that they 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 thought was the Dalai Lama. They were like a group of of kids, and then he was one. He was like the one who could have almost become the Dalai Lama because it was so convincing. Uh, he came and gave a talk there, and, and, he, was, and he, he said something that was very interesting. I asked him about how does a bodhisattva make sure that they're able to have as many beings as possible? And, he's, and he said, just establish relationships, uh, meaningful relationships with as many beings as possible. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's the... That's what I was doing. I was studying so many, many things at the same time when I was studying with you know, Rato Rinpoche. And it wasn't that I was confused about, should I be a Hindu, should I be? A... I, I was knew that I was, my, my main philosophy of life was Buddhism. But these were giving me context, especially for Buddhism. Hinduism gave me the context out of, give me a context to understand Buddhism. How, the, because it was the milieu that uh, Buddhism came out of. What it, the relationship it had with Buddhism uh, definitely affected Buddhism. And if, when you understand those kind of origin relationships, it helps you to understand some of the things that are taught in Buddhism. Can you think of an example of one of those connections? Uh, like social context. A lot of things are uh, social, uh, socially, uh, socially contextual. Like, for example, the idea... What, here you are living in a society and then there is this guy talking about nirvana. Was it something, was it a word that he invented or was it some sort of, under, there was some sort of understanding about that term and then he sort of uh, uh, refined it for them. The idea of nirvana, the idea of also certain things about, especially why did the Buddha continue with the, the, uh, the, the litany of gods that are in Hinduism. Why didn't he just uh, toss them aside? Why did he continue with them? Why did he had 
showed a, a kind of respect for their status, Brahmas and Indras. So what, what, what was the understanding there? So when you, when you understand how the culture understood Brahma, their relationship with Brahma, and how it is carried on into Buddhism, then it would give you a, a, a deep, I would say, a richer understanding of the Buddhist perspective of Brahma and Nirvana and the Chakravatins and why did he choose the, the word Buddha? Did he invent the word Buddha? So what was the contextual understanding, social understanding of the word itself? So things like that. Fascinating. And I'm curious, you're, of course, studying Buddhism, uh, Hinduism at the Raman's uh, Himalayan Institute, and also Rosicrucian uh, studies, which I imagine had a practical component to it also. What was your daily practice like uh, at that time? Were you using all of those elements? Uh, were you emphasizing personal practice at that time? With the Rosicrucian, it, it was, there was a practice that you do, a, a ritual that you would do every, every day. But it wasn't, it wasn't really, uh, it, was, it was a secular tradition. It wasn't a religious tradition. It was more philosophical, but there was a, a practice that you were given. And, that, and, and I, was, I was doing that practice ever since I was 16. It was mainly a way of a, a kind of training in meditation. So I had already had that training of meditation. With the with Hinduism, it was more the yogas, and the yogas within uh, within Hinduism sort of give me the context to understand tantra. And with with Buddhism, it was more of a, how do I relate with people on, on a daily basis? That was my, that was not the main practice I was doing at the time. So relating with people on a daily basis, that's my Buddhism, the kind of a yoga kind of thing, either body yoga or mind yoga that was within the context of uh, Hinduism. And in terms of our daily sit down and practice kind of thing in front of a altar, that was with <laughs> Buddhism. And eventually Buddhism took over all, the, all that, but they, they still informed how I incorporated the Buddhist parts in my life later on. That's very interesting. Could you describe the specifics of the Rosicrucian practice you were doing daily since 16? Uh, uh, the, the Rosicrucian fraternity is like Western Tantra in a sense of you're given a practice, and you're supposed to keep it secret. No one is supposed to know. So I started to train how to keep a secret with them. Uh, there was an altar, and there was a sense of calling upon your higher self and meeting that higher self. So that, that was the practice. Uh, and you had to arrange the altar in a certain way. There were certain symbolic things that you were given from the Rosicrucian order that you placed on the altar, on your altar to sort of remind you of certain things, your aspirations, reminders of the end goal. But also within the Rosicrucianism, uh, there was a sense, I'm sure they took that from the Bodhisattva idea in, of Buddhism. There was a sense of being a service in the world, but in a very, in a very practical way, like help economically, help in education, help. So you were training yourself to go out into the world and do practical help. So I got that from them. So they sort of... Uh, give me a head start with the Bodhisattva idea. And the Bodhisattva idea that I received, and or as it probably has it is being given within Buddhism, it's more of an abstract kind of thing. Your, your Bodhisattva is supposed to go out and help sentient being be free of suffering, but it's, it, but it's very, it's somewhat abstract. It's not like master economics, so you can help, uh, 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 so you can help our communities come out of poverty, master med medicine, so you can help people uh, uh, who are sick. It was more like a spiritual kind of thing, just by doing the spiritual things and somehow people would be, become healthy, somehow people, people get out of poverty. 
But I always thought that they should go hand in hand. They should, uh, the Bodhisattva shouldn't be just an abstract. It should be someone, not necessarily going around saying, uh, uh, hello, my name is so and I'm a Bodhisattva. <laughs> But there should be some. There should be should be seen that uh, uh, maybe some practical uh, practice and practical aspect to it. Yeah. And 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 I'm sorry to say that I'm somewhat avoiding telling you the specifics that I was doing in the Wazikusian order because it was a secret society, and uh, not that what they were doing was so apt, you know so outrageous, but just to honor that I, okay, I'm giving this to you secretly. I'm, I'm asking you if you're gonna take it, not to give it to someone who, who doesn't, who's not within this uh, culture, just like with Tantra. So what I can sort of give you, I give you some sort of a general idea of what we do. We had mm -hmm. an altar, we sat in front of it, and there was a, a, some sort of practice that we did where to sort of summon our higher selves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, very, yeah, very interesting. And uh, of course, without revealing uh, the specifics of the practice, then would you consider that there was an aspect of shamatha or shine uh, that that also sort of technical meditation training? It seems like uh, your Rosicrucian studies and also your yoga studies prepared you. I recognize perhaps our listeners, I'm sure our listeners will also, elements that one would associate with Buddhist tantric ritual in in the description you've given of your Rosicrucian practice. So I'm wondering also if there was, uh, as there sometimes is in Western occultism, quite an emphasis on states of concentration, for example, everything from Crowley to Barden, have, have, you know, they emphasize that in their publicly available, you know, yeah. uh, works. So I'm curious if that was a part of that training or, or if that's something that you acquired later in your Buddhist journey. Uh, that was a uh, part of the training. And what I would, what, what I would, uh, what I encountered within the Western training, within whether it's mysticism, whether it's uh, 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 philosophy, they seem to be missing, uh, probably because unlike Buddhism, there is almost, you could say, uh, a strong tradition of handing down the, the technology. Here's the technology and you in, inherit it, you, you, you implement it and you, in, you, you sort of improve upon it. Not necessarily make it better, but you, you make it accessible to yourself and then to make it accessible to others. So there is that. And I think within Rose Cushion, there, there, it, it lacks that. It was lacking that. Okay, here's the technology, but there isn't really a tradition of masters, so to speak, to explain this in the, in the intricacies of the technology. But that you find in Buddhism. There is deep, uh, you could say, studies and research about the technologies that they have. So when they just give you the technology, you don't, you don't receive it in a way where you're supposed to take it more with faith, but you can reason it. And you're even, you're even encouraged to inquire, you're even encouraged to, to analyze it. You're even, you could say you're, you're encouraged to see are there any flaws in there, in this? Uh, I, think, I think that's one of the elements that, uh, yeah, that comparison in comparing the Buddhist, what I receive from, from Buddhism and what I receive from Western mysticism. Yes, within, uh, within uh, there was, especially with the Rosicrucians, there were practices of what we may or may call shamatha, but there wasn't a tradition of having refined techniques of achieving it. It was more like love, here it is. Go develop it. But how do I develop it? No, just go develop it. But within Buddhism, love, go develop it. Oh, don't know how to do it? Okay, do this, do that. And what are you getting now? Okay, once you get this now, do this, do that. What are you getting now? Do this, do that. Yeah. Hmm. And that's what I found.
Amazing. In 1994, you ordained as a monk in the Gelug uh, lineage. And I'm um, curious, how, how old were you in 94? And what was it that led to that decision? Mm -hmm. uh, so after some time, uh, going to uh, my teacher's uh, center, Rinpoche's center for quite some time, that's where the monks, every once in a while, when, I would, when they would see me, they'd say, ah, you are a monk. Ah, you are a monk. <laughs> And the leaning of, of uh, the priest life, so to speak, was somewhat still within me. Uh, I mean, I wasn't, uh, and, and, and I thought becoming ordained, becoming a, a monk was a, a way of somehow I would receive some special teachings that only monks receive that would accelerate my, 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 my practice. Uh, I think I finished with, I had long finished with, uh, with my degree already and I was, wasn't really, I wasn't doing anything with that degree as well as working with it. I was working just to have food and shelter and enough money so I can travel to New Jersey <laughs> to study. Um, and, uh, I was also studying with uh, one of the uh, senior students of, of Rinpoche uh, and, and he was a monk and I asked him and I began to inquire about uh, this monk thing. I'm interested in it. I would, like, I would like to know more about it. I would like to one day to become a monk. And he said, oh, very nice. He was sounding very happy that I asked that question almost as if they were already planning it without my knowing. And uh, he said, I'm going to talk to Rinpoche about it. And he came back to me and said, ah, great. I spoke to Rinpoche about it. And he's very excited. And, and I'm thinking, okay, now he's arranged an interview with me, Rinpoche, so I can ask Rinpoche questions about, okay, what do I need to do to prepare to be a monk and how long will it take for me to finally become a monk? Instead, what I had, uh, the, what I thought was the interview date was actually the date of my ordination. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'll talk to Rinpoche about it. He's very excited. Okay, you're going to be ordained in four months. I said, what? <laughs> that's, not, that's not exactly what I asked. That's, I was just inquiring, what should I do? How do I prepare? Um, I, and then at that time, uh, that's when I started to rely on I guess, uh, what would you call that? On luck or, or divination. I, I was uh, looking for signs. This is the first time I was really looking for signs. Okay, I'm a, I love beautiful things. I love dancing. I know I'm supposed to uh, stay away from those kinds of things once I become a monk. So am I ready? And I would ask, I would uh, do strange things like, if a woman walks, comes through, through that door wearing a red dress, that's a sign that I should be a monk. And then lo and behold, a woman came through the door wearing a red dress. I said, ah, damn it. <laughs> I guess I'm supposed to be a monk. And I would do things like that. If such and such like happened, I guess I'm supposed to be a monk. And then those things would come to pass. I guess I'm supposed to be a monk. And within, and didn't have time to order my robes. So I had to actually, I had to literally sew my own robes. So I sewed my robes, I made them, I mean, with my hands, with my sewing machine, bought the fabric and I had to get a, a, a model of what the robe is supposed to look like. So I made it. Uh, and within four months I was ordained. And right before ordination, I thought I'm gonna, asked to leave my family behind, my mother, my father, my sisters. I was gonna be sent away somewhere to study. Uh, so I was preparing myself for that. And most of all, I thought, oh, now I'm gonna have about 300 vows to follow. I'm gonna be constrained. But as soon as I uh, received the, or the, the ordination, instead of feeling trapped by 300 vows of not to do's, I felt for, for the first time, I felt, wow, I feel free. 
I don't feel constrained. I actually feel free. Uh, and the and actually in 1990, yeah, and I became a, a Gitsu, a, a novice, and then the following year I became a Gilong, a fully ordained monk. Yeah, I was uh, 28 when that happened. Yeah, was it 28? I'm not that good with, I don't, I don't like recalling my age. <laughs> Subconsciously, I make myself forget. <laughs> what did your family think of your decision to ordain? Ah, my father thought, ah, you're just going through a phase. Uh, eventually, you will go out of it. But he knew that I was deep into philosophy, deep into uh, uh, understanding the nature of the world was a very serious thing for me. So he supported me, but he thought I was just going through a phase, especially the phase about being a celibate. Please. No. <laughs> uh, he had nine children. <laughs> and for my mother, who was a devout Catholic, she taught, uh, she trusted my decisions, but she thought that uh, I was making an error because, you know, we have to follow Jesus to be saved. But she trusted me. So she supported me. Uh, but she went around telling her friends that uh, I, am a, I became a priest. So among my mother's friends, I was called uh, father. <laughs> uh, yeah, so they, they, I would say they were very supportive. And uh, because I thought I was going to be sent away from them, once I became ordained, I asked for uh, special permission for my parents to actually be present in my ordination. So my parents were there well, when I was being ordained, yeah. So the witnesses saw that it wasn't, for my mother, she witnessed that I was in some, in some very strange thing that was taking, her, taking me away from her. And then my father saw that this was a very serious, very serious thing. You were a monk for 21 years, actually. Yeah. 21 years, so. I must have been around 23 or something, 24 when I became a day. Yeah. You mentioned uh, celibacy there. And in fact, on your YouTube channel, which I'll include a link to in the show notes, I encourage people to go there. Many talks there actually that you've done. You have a talk there actually about sexuality. Yeah. And uh, you talk there about how you related to sexuality at various different stages of your life from being a child, uh, having st strong sexual feelings awakening and not really having a, a, a context to discuss them, mm -hmm. um, to uh, uh, going through various other phases and, and then of course becoming a celibate monk. Mm -hmm. And you talk actually about some of the struggles with that aspect of life in that talk. I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about uh, the life of a monk. What's it like and what uh, were the, you mentioned you felt free. What were some of the, the good parts, but also what were some of the, the struggles? S celibacy, for instance, I wonder if there are other struggles um, mm -hmm. or challenges in that lifestyle. Mm. Ah. Well, my life as a monk was not your, your peculiar life of a monk. It was, I was just very unique because my life as a monk was spent not within the monastery. My uh, full time was not in the monastery. The monastery was actually, was actually, the time I spent in the monastery was actually vacation time. I would go to the monastery, but I had a full time job. As I was doing the full, during the entire time that I was a monk, I was a monk, uh, I, you could say I, I experienced monastic 
kind of life as a monk on the weekends when I would go to my teacher's temple. And on vacation days, I would go to Sera Monastery in South India. And also would go to Dharamsala. So these were the times when I experienced what, what people would know, would normally know as monastic life. But most of my time I was with regular people, with, with people who didn't even know that I was a monk. Uh, I would wear my robes when I get home, but in the morning when I wake up, I would put on suit, go to work, go to the office, and then when I would come home, change, put on my robes, and on the weekends, my robes would be on all the time, and then I love it when I'm in, uh, doing vacation time, I would wear my robes all the time, but my robes were not on me five days a week, <laughs> nine to five. <laughs> Uh, so that was one aspect of it. Uh, and the sense of community that people would experience in a monastery, I wasn't, uh, it wasn't a, a strong experience for me. And the sense of, and even though this was, I didn't realize this, even though I was outside of a monastery, outside of a community of monks, there was still a connection with them, uh, almost, a, almost, almost as if there was, a, there was this universal community that no matter where you are, when you're wearing a robe, you sort of feel, you sort of feel the, the, the community wherever you are. You feel it, even though you're not around them. The first time I went to Sera Monastery, and that's where my main teacher was the abbot of, uh, I became very close with the monks there. As soon as I arrived there, I was fully accepted. Uh, uh, even though I didn't look like them, but they, 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 just saw, they saw just another monk. And I, f I had a very strong, felt a very strong connection to them. And at the end of the vacation, it was time for me to leave. I felt so sad. I was, and, uh, and uh, I packed up all my things and I put them in the car and I got in the car and I turned around and I saw them coming out to say goodbye and I, and I started crying. I, uh, uncontrollably, I was crying. It was because the sense of the community that, that, that I felt there was very strong, so palpable. And it wasn't only, it was only when I was leaving did I, did, did, did it become so, so real to me? When I was in the midst of it, I didn't quite, wasn't quite aware of it. It's like uh, a fish not aware of water or something like that. But it was only when I left that I realized, oh my goodness, this, this sense of community is so powerful, so real. And the sense of community, I, I feel it even when I'm away from the monastery. And when I'm, uh, when the Dalai Lama is giving a teaching and I'm sitting on the, on the stage with, with him with a bunch of other monks, I, then it comes back again and I feel myself in the, in the midst of my people, so to speak. I've always felt like I'm with my people, even though they don't look like me, so to speak. Uh, so my struggle was with lacking that constant community constant uh, being in the, in, the, in the midst of uh, monks because when I was going uh, to work nine to five, I didn't live with monks. I, uh, I live with, uh, for a period, short period of time, I live with, with some monks. Uh, two of them were friends of mine. We were studying where was the Christians together. We studied other kinds of Western occult <laughs> studies together. And they also became a monk. They also took, took on a monastic and then we sort of lived together for a while, but eventually we drifted apart from each other and I was living by myself most of the time as a monk. Uh, in terms of uh, sexuality, my relationship with that was at a very young age, there was this, all of, all of a sudden this feeling that came up and I really didn't have anyone to go talk to. My father was gone. 
and I was with my uh, with my uh, aunt. She was the one who was taking care of me. My my, sis, my mother left. I didn't really have anyone to talk to about it, and I, what I heard through Christian teachings who go into to, to, to church was, it was a bad thing. So there was a kind of a shame for having this kind of feeling. Um, but there was a, maybe this uh, uh, propensity for celibacy within me at the, also at the same time. At the same time, there was a celibacy. There was, a, I, I didn't really have an urge, so to speak, but let me put it this way. It wasn't a constant urge <laughs> like most young men experience, but rather it was like an avalanche that would, that would uh, come over me over a period of time and it would go away. And then my mind, was just, my mind would just be totally towards celibacy, celibacy as that's the ideal for me. And I, and I would read books on um, praising the celibate life. And I related with them. I said, oh yeah, this is what I want. I guess because of that, it made it, made it easy for me to become a monk. So being a monk wasn't, uh, it wasn't difficult for me. It wasn't a difficult thing for me to take on celibacy, to take on not being away, uh, staying away from society, being, uh, I guess, <laughs> being trained in being antisocial, but not, not antisocial in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a rude way, but you know, it's okay if you're not social, if you're not, if you're not deep into society. It, as a matter of fact, you're encouraged to not, uh, to not allow yourself to go deep into society. So that, 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 all that came natural to me. And, be, and in, uh, and it, it was only as a celibate monk that I realized the, uh, not, not realized, but that I began to have a proper relationship with sexuality. I didn't, I didn't see it as, a, uh, as an evil. I didn't see it something that I should be uh, dedicate myself to also. I, you could say, by uh, I, in that, the, what I came to realize, this is what you could say, what I came to realize, what I came to realize was we humans over period, long periods of time, for whatever reason, we have developed a dysfunctional relationship with sexuality. And when you're on the path, especially within, uh, within the Buddhist context, even within Christian context also, but especially within uh, Buddhist context, we have to begin readdress our dysfunctional relationship, relationship with, with sexuality. And at first, the most uh, powerful, the most immediate thing you can do to readdress that dysfunctional relationship is to stay away. That's the celibate part. And as you begin to heal our dysfunction by not relating with it in a direct way, and you begin to realize it to be an energy. It's the creative energy. And then later on, you begin to redirect that creative energy. And you can go be in a, in a lay life and have normal re relationships, but you're in that relationship now in a healthy way. You're relating with your sexuality in a healthy way. Or you can be a high level tantric uh, yogi where you're still dealing with sexuality but no it's no longer dysfunctional so that has been my sort of journey with sexuality i'm still you know the, the 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 habits that i've developed over long periods of time they're still with me there's still some dysfunction but it's not as big as it used to be before and what i loved about buddhism uh, was even though, okay, do, uh, you're given a precept, you're thinking about do not, uh, as a monk, do not engage in sex. But it doesn't mean that you're not supposed to find out why. And you're, you're, you're given some reasons, but the reasons that you're given are tools to help you maintain celibacy. Like 
it's evil, it's evil, stay away from it, it drags you to samsara. But all that, you know, is just a, a means to help you. And eventually, you're even, you're even told later on, hey, you better, you, you better have lots of it. <laughs> to be able to, you, you better have lots of sexual energy to be able to make it on the path, yeah. Uh, yeah, I hope I answered that, those questions. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it, very interesting indeed. I'm curious what you would identify as the dysfunction in sexuality. You said that um, there's a lot of dysfunction. One of the ways of healing that it seems you're proposing is, is through a path of, of uh, celibacy, for example. Could you think of some examples or could you analyze the uh, nature of and characteristics of the dysfunction? Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna sound like uh, like I'm a, a philosophy professor here, <laughs> a, a theology uh, professor here, something like that, as if I'm someone who's a deep great scholar of theology and philosophy and religion. Uh, but I'm, this is just the guys I'm gonna have to take. To, to try to explain my perspective on this, right? Uh, as when humanity started to gain, to be awake, to be self-aware, to be self-aware, uh, they begin to, they, they somehow they, make a, they made a discovery with, about with sexuality. They recognize a power there and they wanted to relate with that power. They, they respected that power and they wanted to relate with it properly. Uh, and over periods of time, there came, there came different ways of, look at different modalities of how to deal with the power that we realize that is within sexuality itself. Then you started, that's when you have different traditions, different, uh, different religions, different uh, cultures, started to regulate how to approach sex. You're supposed to have sex only with this and that. You're not supposed to have sex with this and that. You're supposed to have sex only when, at this time and at that time. Uh, uh, you're supposed to have sex only within this context and not outside its context. So I think all this were ways of from an outside, trying to understand something that was happening within us, this sexual urge. And I have to say, <laughs> uh, because all this was coming from outside, not from a, an inner, inner uh, exploration, it was mainly uh, cultures and societies coming up with, okay, this is how it should be done. And this is what we're gonna, this is what we're going to impose upon them. This is what we understand it to be. This is what we think it is. And this is what we are gonna make into a rule for everyone to, to, to abide by. And over millennia of people trying to abide by these rules, there was, you could say, uh, re rejections of these rules, but at the same time, feeling guilty for rejecting the rules outright rejecting the rules, but at the same time, ho holding on to these rules very tightly. So over time, uh, humans as a whole develop a dysfunctional, what I call a dysfunctional way of dealing with, with sexuality, where be just because you, you have sexual urges, you, at the same time you have guilt. Why should you have guilt because you have sexual, sexual urges? And then this carries on from your childhood until your adulthood. And it's, some, it's not something that is never really uh, reconciled. It's something that is never, uh, you don't really have, uh, there isn't really real sex education. What we receive right now, nowadays, if we receive it as sex education, it's not really sex education. It's really biology. When this and that comes together, this happens. 
it's not really sex education because sexuality is not just bio biological in terms of the, the physics, but also the emotional components is very, very, very um, important involved. So there isn't really uh, a true attempt at really understanding it and then transmitting this understanding to others. And, be, and because of that, our parents, and our parents, 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 parents had their, uh, uh, yeah, the traumatic, traumatic experiences of how to deal with this. And then basically they have just transmitted this uh, traumatic, their traumatic experience and we added our traumatic experience with it. And we said, we, we are, we are, what we have right now is just a, a ball, a jumble of traumatic experiences when it comes to sexuality. Either we feel we have to overindulge, we make it the most important thing as if that's what life is about, it's just about having that. Or we underemphasize it, trying to kill it because we think uh, it's some sort of evil that exists or something. Uh, so over a period of time, sorry for this lecture, <laughs> over a period of time, uh, humanity as a whole has transmitted their misunderstanding of this very natural thing. It's only now that we, uh, when I say now, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about our century, but you know, look at humanity as a whole for the entire time that they've been on this planet, only within maybe the past, maybe millennia or so, that we've actually begin to look at this, wait a minute, isn't this natural? But it's already too late, we've already been, we, we already been uh, especially, and this is what the religion part, especially with the newer religions, the newer religions, the, most of the newer religions inherited a view that sexual, there's something evil in sexuality. Even though they, they have regulations about how to use it, because if it was completely evil, they would tell you, don't use it at all. But they, they see it as the means to all vices, the means, the door to all the evils that we experience in the world. Uh, and, and because they've inherited that, they've formulated it, these unnatural ways of dealing with sexuality. And, and that's what's been, been passed on for the past thousand years or so. This unnatural way of dealing with something that is so natural. Yeah. So that's why our relationship with it is dysfunctional. That's very interesting. How did you come to that view? I'm curious. So you're describing there sexuality as a multi generational ball of traumatic experiences. Mm -hmm. um, how did you come to that view? What I'm asking, I suppose, is the lineage of thought that informs that perspective. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have, uh, you could say Tantra, not, not that to give people the wrong idea that people already are, are forming about Tantra, but uh, it, it's, it's, it, it, it's the, uh, the environment or the context, the container of, of Tantra that helped me to come to, to that realization. Looking at the Buddhist path, for example, especially within the, the Tibetan tradition, where you have uh, the, uh, you start from what is called open teaching, and then you end up with secret teaching. And in the open teaching, there's a lot of, you encounter a lot of rules about don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. And you're supposed to master don't do this, don't do that up to a certain point, and then when you're being introduced to Tantra, you're slowly being asked, okay, reintroduce yourself to this, reintroduce yourself to that. The things that you're asked to avoid, now reintroduce yourself to it. So that's what led me to understand that, ah, we were asked to stay away from it because we couldn't deal with it. Why couldn't we deal with it? Because of what we have inherited of how to deal with it. We cannot deny that 
there is somewhat of a dysfunctional attitude for me. Uh, my Catholic upbringings, for example, I would say it gave me a healthy dose of dysfunctional relationship with sexuality, especially, especially you're not even supposed to talk about it. At least within the context that, uh, that, I, was, that I was raised, you're not even supposed to talk about it, but it's something very important you do uh, somewhere, but you're not prepared when that important thing comes, <laughs> when that important time comes. So we create our own things from what we see, from what we, under, from what we, uh, we are told, which would mismatch ideas. So, but that's not only uh, this newer religions, we're not only, uh, but newer religions, newer thoughts, they didn't just pop up in the, uh, into existence just like that wholesale. They were influenced by certain things that, that eventually uh, led to their creations. And this was happening all over the world most of the world. And also in, uh, within the context of, of India. Uh, and the idea of, of uh, abstain, restrain, alcohol, sex, and certain kinds of diet is because you come, if you were completely healthy, you would just continue to be healthy. And that would not worry about restraining from these things. But because we are caught in a pattern of self-destruction, engaging in these, in these things, uh, what, someone drinks and become self-destructive and destructive others. So you're, you don't know how to relate with alcohol properly. So stay away from it. You're engaged in sexuality. You're hurting yourself. You're hurting others emotionally and you, you, you can't function properly in society. You don't know how to deal with sex, stay away from it. But in order to help us stay away from those things, you're, it's like, a, I would say, almost like a, the, way, the way an adult helps a child understand a concept that is very, very uh, deep, very profound. You create stories, stay away from, from this. It is evil, it is bad. See what it does, see what it does, see what it does. So you could oh, oh, so you, so you, you develop a kind of aversion, but the aversion is just a tool, a, me a mechanism to make you stay away from a bad habit of self-destruction because you don't know, we don't know how to deal with these things properly, these powerful energies. And eventually we gain some distance and that distance gives us a, a, a bit of a freedom from that, from the tendencies. And because the space of that tendency that we have, we have uh, achieved, then you could say we have a, a bit of an inner strength now. It's not so much that we are driven by some past traumatic experience driving us through these things, but we have developed some sort of inner strength. And once we have developed this inner strength, now we are told when you're being introduced to Tantra, and it's not only with, within Tantra per se as the name as uh, the uh, official uh, tradition that calls us of Tantra. Every tradition has something within it that's Tantric-like, where what you were asked to avoid in the beginning, you develop a certain strength from the distance of it. That is, you develop a certain strength from not being engaged in the bad habit. The habit is now gone down. And now you're told, oh, by the way, those things are very powerful things, you need them. Now that you're not sick, you're not, they're not gonna over, or they're not gonna... I'm terribly sorry about that. I thought the laptop was receiving power, but actually it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, I guess that was the case. Do you remember where you were or shall I remind you? Uh, yeah, remind me. <laughs> uh, well, before, before we got cut off there, I was asking you about the lineages of thought that informed this view. I know you're well read in Western philosophy, and of course you have a, a deep education in Buddhist philosophy also. And so I'm wondering from what you're saying, if, if you could say, oh, this, uh, this is some, something of Shantideva here, or this is a little bit of Rousseau or something like that. Mm, okay. Um... Or is it something you, you came to through your own uh, path? I would have to say it's something that I came through my own path, but I have to give credit to the combination of the teachers and uh, writers that I've read 
uh, especially the writers of the actual age, the, the movement that happened during the actual age, especially those people. Uh, there were, you could say there was an attempt at proper realistic uh, uh, trying to deal with sexuality, with, with sexuality. But there was already a well-developed uh, uh, thought of forming around uh, sexuality is evil, stay away from it. And they seem, I would say, both to be touching something that was real, where they didn't uh, uh, develop totally in isolation from each other. They informed each other, even though they developed distinct philosophy, different modes, but they were informing each other. Like, for example, in Buddhism, they still adopted, yes, there's some evil, there's some evil in, in sexuality, uh, in Christianity and in Western philosophies, Zoroastrianism and all these uh, different kinds of philosophies. Uh, they, there is an understanding of of uh, you get into trouble with sex. And probably it's because we've had examples of, oh, that person killed that person because it was over, overtaken by, by desire. So see, that, that, that's what sex gets you into. Rather than saying, uh, that person has a dysfunctional relationship with sexuality, that's why they behave that way. But since most of us inherited the possibility of doing something extraordinary, extraordinary like that. So to, to sort of mitigate having to, everyone having to go through that, and that's when they develop these kinds, of, um, these kinds of thoughts. I don't really have, I wish uh, uh, like my teacher would, uh, that was the amazing thing about my teacher, it, it, uh, the thing that he, that, it, almost like it wasn't a demonstration, but some, something that can be said to be a demonstration. He was in his late age, he was uh, being honored by the monastery. He went there to, to, to receive the honor. And reluctantly after many years saying, no, 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 eventually he went there. And when he sat on the throne to being honored, he started reciting texts that you're supposed to have memorized when you were a little boy things that people forget, you know, way before they, they even leave the artist. It was still reciting. So I don't have that kind of mind, <laughs> unfortunately, where I'm able to, I'm even uh, on the spectrum, I'm on the opposite side. I'm not able to say Shantideva said this, Shantideva said that. But even I, I can say, oh yeah, Shantideva, I know that guy. I think I read some of his books. <laughs> like I do know, oh yes, I read some of his books, but I, I'm not able to directly quote them. Uh, but I know that what I'm saying is informed by what they have written, by what I have read from, from them, where they are supporting the idea, uh, uh, especially with sexuality. Uh, basically, what, I'm, what I've read from it is the, the mindfulness of acknowledge that you are sick. And it's not entirely your fault. Yes, you participate in it, of course, but it's because of what you have inherited from your culture. You are now sick when it comes to your relationship with sexuality. Acknowledge that. And once you've acknowledged that, then begin to begin the process of having a proper re relationship with it. What can you do right here, right now? Do that to eventually arrive at a, a proper relationship with, with sexuality. And the reason I'm, I, I'm, this line of, came to me is because with my training, when I'm studying the Vinaya, the, the way we are, uh, the way, the, the kind of mindset you're being trained to have towards sexuality is it, are examples like, uh, see how those, People who are involved in a lay life, see how miserable they are, see how, over, see how the kind of things that they do because of that. So when you say, oh, okay, I want to avoid that. I want to avoid that. So you begin to 
you, you begin the, uh, the process of avoiding because that's all you can do right now. You cannot just go into sexuality and then fix it. You don't have the power yet. So by staying away, as you're staying away, you're not supposed to just stay away, you're supposed to stay away and train yourself. And you train yourself in such a way without the distraction. It's like uh, a soldier doesn't train to be a soldier by being dumped in a war. You, you're away from a war, you're training, you're training, you're training, and then you're taken into, a war, into the war. So that's the, the, the uh, staying away from, that's how I, I see it. And, and I have to say, uh, with me, it, it was the, the, the same thing that, that, that made it possible for me to say, oh, being a celibate, is nothing difficult with that because I was having the struggles where certain times, most certain periods of time, maybe it was because of the full moon, I'm not sure. <laughs> when there was like this huge urge, like almost like a need, I need to do this, I need to do that. Uh, then there were these very long periods of time, I said, that thing is nothing. I don't see why people are having a problem with it. <laughs> uh, that's for kids having to deal with that. So, I, I adopted that, that attitude. I carried that, that attitude with me uh, through, throughout the years that I was a monk. But I kept questioning. I kept questioning because uh, fortunately for me, uh, as, as it is said, the Dharma, one of the definitions of the Dharma is that that which it, it invites you to inquire, it invites you to investigate it. The Dharma is not uh, shy, nor is it afraid of being investigated. So I would ask myself sincerely, what's wrong with having sex while you're a monk? I would ask myself that question, not that I would, you know, <laughs> go have uh, flings per se, but uh, I, I would question that. I would question it with, it with, 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 with an openness. Maybe it is wrong to abstain from sex, from sex. Maybe it is wrong, but why would it be right? Why would it be wrong? So I would ask myself those questions. So the, the, the books that I was reading at that time, they were basically promoting, giving good reasons to stay away, but only with, uh, I would say with the, I mentioned earlier, the same way an adult would teach a child something profound using stories. So almost as if a, a, more, a more evolved person of someone who has more uh, proper relationship with the strategy, understanding that there's no way we're gonna immediately understand this profundity of what they're saying. So they give us stories that, that makes us stay away. And eventually you start to grow up you start to realize that, oh, these are just stories to help me at the time when I had no means of helping myself. Now I'm able to look at this thing uh, squarely. Uh, it's, uh, it's almost the story, uh, sorry, <laughs> it's almost the story of the, the, two, the two monks, one older, one younger traveling and then they saw a lady crossing a, uh, a dangerous river and then the older monk just carried her and put on the other side. And, and the younger monk is very angry at, at, at the older monk. Don't, you're a monk, that's what you're touching women. And uh, you know, at the end of the story, okay, I, I dropped her a long time ago, but why, you, why are you still carrying her? <laughs> so someone can be, and this is something that I realized as a, during the uh, time here and there that I was with the community of monks, you could be a celibate on, on the outside, but you're not a celibate inside. You are wanting, you are driven by a wanting, wanting. And when, as you're dri driven by this wanting uh, to express sexuality, and the only way you, we've been taught to express it are these ways. Uh, and there is this wanting to express it in those ways. But I'm a monk, I'm not supposed to do that. I'm a monk, I'm not supposed to do that. So you, 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 you are developing a psychological trauma with this 
constant struggle within you. Uh, and there are those who are in, fa in families who have children and they have a proper relationship with sexuality. And you could say, in a way, they are celibate. They have, they have established a proper relationship with their, with their sexuality. Uh, and I'm trying to answer the question about the line of thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, so being that, as a, being trained as a monk, being trained to stay away from it, being given teaching to why I should stay away from it. And all of a sudden I am now in studying Tantra and then I'm told this thing I'm supposed to was evil, stay away from. I'm told that it has power and then through transmuting it, I'm gonna be able to achieve the goal that I was trying to reach when I was trying to stay away from it. So I say, ah, all oh, this is just a, 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 a means of getting somewhere. And the, the, the proper thing is to have, that's my conclusion that I think that they're trying to teach me is they're, they're trying to teach me have a proper relationship with this. And it's not just with sexuality, but all the all, all very strong emotions, anger and things like that. Even, even with anger, you're supposed to have a proper relationship with it. Stay away from it. Don't know how to deal with it right now. So right now, just practice patience in a way that you can practice patience. Stay away from the, the energy of anger. And then later on, you're told to, hey, you better, <laughs> you need that energy. You better start using it properly. Okay. Very fascinating indeed. You know, um, I'd love to ask you in a moment about uh, how it was you uh, came to leave the monastic life. You've uh, given uh, elsewhere in some of your public talks uh, some very interesting reasons for that decision. I'd like to ask you about them. Uh, but perhaps before that, you're 21 years as a monk, working full time, but with the monastic uh, vows, etc. How did that happen? Why did you go that route rather than say becoming a, a monk um, in a monastery, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. This is to think the, the what the, uh, one thinks of as a monk, you know, in the monastery, right? Um, yeah. So I'm curious how that happened, and also I'm curious in terms of, of course, the Golupa, famous for their scholastic uh, emphasis. So I'm curious if you went through the um, curriculum of that particular order, and also. And so th this is sort of a group of questions to do with your being a monk. And also, uh, you mentioned also Evans Wentz. Yeah. And the yoga, Six Yogas of Naropa, for example, in his Secret Doctrines of Tibet, I think is probably the book you were referring to. Yeah. You, you, yeah. you read it before you should have read it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious if you, if you uh, also were trained in, in those uh, yogas. So really, why was it that you were a monk who's also working for 21 years and not living in a monastery, number one? And number two, what about the scholastic side of the Galupa? And number three, those, those yogas, those uh, completion stage, um, high yoga tantra yogas. Yeah. It wasn't that I chose uh, the life of a monk living in society. It just, that's how it happened to, to be for me. Uh, if you remember when I, before I became ordained, I thought I was gonna be sent off somewhere to some monastery somewhere and I would not see my family ever again. Uh, but it was just having just the circumstances of where I was. The, the temple where my teacher, where I we received my ordination, Rashi Gempeling in Howell, New Jersey. Uh, there were some uh, Tibet, Tibetan monks there. Uh, the reason that I wasn't, actually I found out the reason that I wasn't given full Gelong vows with, it, with that same day, it, traditionally, you, you're a novice, a gitsu, for a period of time, of years, because you're given, you, you're not allowed to become a uh, fully ordained monk until you're right age, right age of 21. So all those monks that we see, they're all gitsus, they're all novices, and they, be, and, they be, and they become fully ordained when they're 21. And some of them leave before they reach 21 because something happens, life, whatever happens, and then they, they, they leave. Uh, the reason that I wasn't uh, made, uh, and this was, I guess, unique for my situation because I was being ordained in the United States. 
uh, in order for you to become a, a gil, uh, you, one monk can make another another novice, but you need a you need a, a sangha, a quorum of fully ordained monks to make another fully ordained monks. There weren't that many <laughs> at the time, so someone had to be invited. So they had to they had to have someone else there present in order for me to be. And the following year, that's when they act, that's when they met that quota. So that's why I was able to be a monk. So in the in the temple in the temple. It can't really call it a monastery. There's, for it to be a monastery, they have to do monastic things, you know, study, debate, do different kinds of rituals. But you said monastery. It was a temple. And it was there to serve the community, more or less. So there were monks who lived there. And these were monks who came from different, different monasteries, some of, them, uh, some of them from Sera, of course, but from different, different monasteries within the Gilbukba. And then they happen, you could say they happened to be living together. They have immigration situations to deal with and all that kind of stuff, trying to their residency, their refugees. Uh, so they didn't really have a monastery there where I can just pop myself in there and then be in the mon mon monastic uh, thing because some of them also had to go to work. A few of them had to go to work so that they can provide for food for themselves. Uh, I mean, some of, some of the things that we, I didn't realize I think a lot of people have fantasies about, I have to say fantasies that they think that the, those buildings that are built in the monasteries, those big temples, they're just like, you know, almost they pop up. No, money <laughs> builds those temples. Money feeds those monks so that they don't starve to death. And what those, where do those money come from? They come from people making donations and also monks doing certain things to, to get some sort of income coming in. But for the most part, monks don't, go to earn a living. They just they live in a monastery, study, practice, and then some um, service to the community and then the community gives, uh, uh, give them what they need so they continue to have home and food and clothing. The monks robes, they don't come from the sky. Uh, so we didn't have that kind of a community in Howell, New Jersey, that would be, uh, 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 economically strong enough to support a, a monastery where people can just leave their jobs and just live there and, 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 and just focus on practicing. So the reason that I had to work was because in order for me to eat, feed myself and have a house and I, I, I could not live there, I needed to work to pay for my lodging and to pay for my food. Uh, I could have, uh, I, at Serame, back in India, I'm not sure exactly what the situation, the immigration situation is right now. As a foreigner, I couldn't just pop myself there and then live there because they're in a refugee community and only the refugees have residency there. Foreigners can come in with permission to enter the, 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 the refugee camp. And then you're only allowed to stay for a period of time and then you have to leave. So I was just a foreigner, even though I had uh, I, I couldn't just say, oh, I'm a monk too. Uh, I cannot stay with them. <laughs> no, as far as the, the government is concerned, I'm just, I'm, I'm a foreigner and I cannot stay there. So I would visit, get my permission, stay there for as long as I can. I think the most I could stay there for like three months at a time. And three months that I'm not, I'm staying there. That means I'm not earning money to feed myself, to house myself. After that is done, I have to go back, earn money, so I can go back and, and, and again, the following year. Uh, so it wasn't really a, a choice per se. And there were eventually now there are monasteries outside of refugee communities. I think uh, like my friend was able to do, but that was way later he was able to do that because I was, by that time I was, I was, I was already used to the way of being a monk that I was a monk that I, I didn't feel like I needed to be in a monastery, to be to be in a monastery, in a monastic uh, community, it was something that I would volunteer to go to <laughs> on my vacations, <laughs> and I and I was working with uh, such a wonderful organization that they actually allowed me to have to take so much time off, so I was lucky in that sense. Yeah. So that was uh, why I was a monk the way I was. It was, I'm in the West, and there weren't uh, 
and that and I think maybe now there are monasteries where Westerners can go and live and maybe some centers they have enough of strong community economically we have to remember mm -hmm. it's not just you have enough land and, and things but economically able to support people to live there yeah so not where I was not not the time when I became a monk yeah. um so now with uh I'm gonna go with the Evans Wens kind of thing <laughs> Uh, this is gonna sound uh, almost sacrilegious, <laughs> and it's my conviction. And, and the reason that I have, the, I, and all my convictions come from context that I read. It was uh, earlier on, before I uh, studied officially with my teachers, officially with the monastic education. Now, as monastic education, I, mean, I did, I did go through the. The, the program of, of study. Um, uh, Parchin, uh, sorry, uh, perfection of wisdom and logic. And, and we were the very, very, very few, not very few, probably the only Westerners at the time who were studying Vinaya. We were studying Vinaya, like full on studying Vinaya with my teacher. And I think we were the only Westerners. And then uh, there were uh, our uh, fellow monks back in Sarah. They were jealous of us. <laughs> you get to study Vinaya. We know we're not even studying Vinaya. We have to wait. <laughs> You're studying Vinaya already. So we uh, we study Vinaya. Uh, and of course, it should be said that your teacher Geshe Lobsang Tarshin was famous scholar. Actually, oh, yes. is it Larampa Geshe, the highest category of Geshe and uh, really renowned mm -hmm. scholar? So you were very fortunate in that regard also. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Extremely fortunate. Yeah, extremely fortunate. Uh, yes, my teacher. In a, in a monastic uh, education, there are different levels of completion of study. One completion of study is that you're tested just within your, you could say, just within your, uh, your house, uh, what would be the equivalent of saying your house? Uh, that would be like your dorm, for example, right? Just your dorm, you're tested within that dorm and then, you, okay, you have that level of, of, of geshe. All that, all those are geshe. And there's a level where you're tested by, your, by the entire monastery. And then there's a, another level where you're tested by the entire Giluk organization itself. And you have to go to different, uh, there are three, three major monasteries of the, within the Gelukpa, and you have to go to each one of these and then prove your, that you know what, you, that what, what, you've, what you've studied. And there are five uh, group texts. You're supposed to memorize one of them. If you want to be, if you want to be tested in a higher level. And the highest level is the Laramba. And the Laramba, they are ones who are, who are tested in front of the, the Dalai Lama himself test, test you. And among those, they have to, they, they, they are graded who was number one for that year. Mm. So my teacher was number one for the time that we, we studied. Yeah, that's how fortunate that, that I, I've somehow ended up meeting this person in Howell, New Jersey. I would have never known that there was a, a there was a place called Howell. <laughs> <in New Jersey. laughs> yeah. So with him, uh, we studied the Vinaya. With him, we studied Lamrim. With him, we studied we could say the entire stages. And we studied uh, the text by a lot of text by Jason Kaba. Uh, the different uh, versions of the Lamrim, the Lamrim Chenmo, Lamrim Jujun. Uh, the shorter, the medium, lam rim. Um, and we also studied logic. My teacher was, uh, uh, he, he always said, I'm a logician, I'm a logician, I'm a logician. <laughs> uh, we studied with him. And also, uh, my teacher was, uh, he was almost going to, if, uh, if it wasn't for the time, if it wasn't for having to escape, he was going to be the 
back in uh, in Tibet, he would have been uh, uh, he, he was the that next level to become the abbot of the tantric monastery where, where he studied. Uh, so he studied all the, you saw he graduated from Sutra, he graduated from Tantra, and then he came to, to the West. So he came, he came to the West already fully accomplished. Uh, and he actually helped write the textbooks. He was a prolific poet also. He helped write the, the grammar books to help for the children to to, uh, to, to learn in uh, in India when they, when they were in India. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so he came to the United States and somehow I ended up being lucky to uh, to to have to have found it. So I, my first teacher was the Logic Abbot, <laughs> and then uh, and what I love about my teacher. He wasn't some Rinpoche from some reincarnation. He said, "Oh, the reason that you're good because you were." You're the reincarnation of such such a great person. It's somebody through his own merit, through his own uh, sweat, achieve what he achieved, and he achieved the highest that could be achieved, scholastically speaking. And uh, we only uh, 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 at his death did we realize that he also mastered those kinds of things because he, he remained in Tukdam for for seven days. Yeah. So I was very very lucky. Uh, and he was rigorous about uh, the, the scholastic part. We would have to sit with him, study, and before he begins, we have to uh, recite <laughs> certain things that we, we were supposed to memorize. So we had we went through the pra the, the practice of of memorizing text, also debating. And that was happening in Howell, New Jersey. And on the way to Howell, New Jersey, on the bus, uh, me and my friends, we would uh, debate. And uh, people would think that we're crazy on the bus, <laughs> having these conversations. Uh, yeah, uh, so that was the, the scholastic part. And also, before I even started that, I was already reading on my own. And the things that I loved reading were the actual sutras themselves. Interestingly enough, in the monasteries, especially in the Mahayana monasteries, you don't really study the sutras, except for specific Mahayana traditions where they have one sutra that's the entirety of their, of their uh, uh, tradition. So they study that sutra and the commentaries of that sutra. I'm not sure if they study that sutra directly itself, but in the, yeah, you don't really read a sutra maybe one here or there, you will read that sutra. But for the most part, what we are studying are commentaries to commentaries to commentaries to sutras. <laughs> uh, but I, uh, whatever sutra was translated into English, I would read that, especially the Pali canon. I read those, whatever, like uh, Godard, whatever he was able to translate, Evan Wenz, th those earlier, Gwenther, whatever they were to, able to translate, sutras that they would translate, I would translate Thomas Cleary, also a beautiful translator of texts. I read those sutras and I was more inspired by those sutras. Uh, and then later on the commentaries that now started to know about, uh, especially within the Gilupa tradition, the different scholars in the Gilupa that are studied from different monasteries, uh, Jason Kappa's disciples, um, uh, even the earlier Kadampa masters, and things like that. So. I would say I received a nice uh, edu scholastic education, yeah. And uh, my teacher was very formal. So within the Galupa, you don't, you don't, the word Tantra is not even known <laughs> until you've studied a certain degree, a certain, a certain amount of sutra. So after we studied a certain amount of sutra, then then Rinpoche introduced us into Tantra. And then he gave us instructions in Tantra. The com as far well as, as, well as the completion stage was concerned. Uh, so you know, the Tantra has generation and completion stage, at least within the Gilupa tradition. Uh, it wasn't uh, until I met Gyume Kinsurimuche that I started to dive deep into the, 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 the completion stage aspects of, this, of, of Tantra. 
But like I said, I did read Evans Wen's uh, Secret Doctrines, <laughs> Secret Doctrines <laughs> of Tibet, uh, where I encountered uh, six yogas of Naropa. And it was mind blowing reading that. Oh my goodness. There are people who actually do these kinds of things, think this kind of way, have these kinds of things that they do. Uh, and I, 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 I tried to sneak that practice every once in a while, but I never felt I was given the permission, proper permission. But that was until much later that I sort of received that permission. Uh, and this is the, what, what I'm gonna, what I said, might sound sacrilegious, okay? <laughs> so I studied Lam Rim. I'm saying Lam Rim, not talk about just the text itself, but rather the stages of the path, right? From beginning to end. I've read the, uh, I studied the open part of the, 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 the path and I've studied and I'm now uh, practicing the secret part of the path. And little by little, what, what I realized, and, and that's what Lam Rim is supposed to help you, supposed to help you understand how everything is connected. Even though there's, there's this, uh, there is a division of open teaching and secret teaching, but they're actually supporting each other. You can't really do one without the other. Uh, now, and here it is. So a lot of people will disagree with me, <laughs> but I'm convinced at this point, and the reason I'm convinced is because exactly of the teachings that I've received sort of summarize things. Uh, Tantra is not necessarily for advanced practitioners. Even though when you're studying Tantra, it's an advanced practice, you're supposed to be very, 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 uh, supposed to feel very, very privileged to be studying Tantra, to be uh, studying Tantra. And in Tantra, you have more and more rigorous practices, more and more so-called powerful, more and more so-called uh, secret, more and more, and more advanced practices. And I'm saying supposedly, and the reason I'm saying supposedly is because of the incident that happened the first time the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truth. The Four Noble Truth is considered to be open teaching. It's not some advanced teaching. It's considered to be the very foundation, the very basis of all the other teachings. But when the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truth the first time, one of the disciples got it and became enlightened. He didn't need Tantra after he, were, he, he, he studied that to become enlightened. He became enlightened just from that. Why didn't the others get enlightened? What did the Buddha do? The Buddha began to elaborate on the Four Noble Truth. And the more he elaborated, the more they got it, and the, because, uh, the more they got it, then the more they, they became realized. And what I'm calling, what I refer to as, uh, the tantric teachings, the reason I say yes, they are advanced practices, but not necessarily for an advanced practitioner. They are advanced method for the stubborn headed who could not get enlightened just with the first. <laughs> and we need even more drastic means of getting to, to the end where just your mind alone is not enough. Just your concentration is not enough. Relating with others in a way is not enough. Now you need to go into your own biology to extract something so you can actually get it. So that's my uh, somewhat psychologist thing. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Thank you. You know, after 21 years of being a monk, you decided to give back your robes. And you said some interesting things about that elsewhere in some of your talks. One of the things you said was that being a monk by then wasn't really that challenging for you. Mm -hmm. And you felt that there were aspects of your personality that weren't developing. And I'm curious what they were. You also said that you felt that as a monk, there was a barrier or some sort of, you weren't able somehow to empathize with people's life challenges because you were, as a monk, 
sort of step removed from that, even though, as we've discovered, you were living uh, within society even during those 21 years. So I'm curious about that aspect as well mm -hmm. and what it was like after 21 years to hand back your robes and become mm -hmm. a lay person. Yeah. Uh, so as a monk, I took it and I was somewhat encouraged to not really develop close relationships with people. I'm already someone of a somewhat, somewhat of a shy personality. So telling someone who's already had predisposition for shyness, oh, you don't really have to engage with people. As a matter of fact, you're encouraged to not to do that. So I spent 21 years being <laughs> basically strengthening my shyness to the, uh, in, in the sense of, uh, yes, I'm in society as a monk, but I'm not really in society. I'm not really engaging people. I'm not really, I'm just sort of doing my time that I have to do with you. And I'm running back home so I can put on my robes, so I can go with my books, so I can go dive in my books, so I can dive into my practice. And when it's time for me to go study with my teacher and be, in the, be, be there and then doing, doing things like doing uh, month stuff, <laughs> so, so to speak, <laughs> doing the serkim and uh, things like that. Uh, so, so inwardly, I was not really connecting with people. So I was spending 21 years strengthening the practice of not connecting with people, even though I was right in the midst of them. And they didn't feel obligated to engage me because he's a monk, so he's supposed to stay away. So they, so they stayed away. Uh, uh, after some time, I started to teach. And the, how I began to teach was based uh, <laughs> Uh, I was asked to review uh, a class and then somehow this reviewing of this class stretched over years <laughs> where different people kept coming in and then somehow I, I, I'm, I'm somehow called a teacher. <laughs> uh, so during those years of sitting down and then people in front of me appearing to, to be students and I'm appearing to be the teacher teaching something, uh, I was wearing my robes, and the robe was like a, was like a wall. Uh, you only have uh, this much closeness with me. I'm not talking about you know, you know, uh, palpable closeness, like uh, you know, hang out kind of thing, and tell me your problems and things like that. Uh, so over years, I, I realized that. Uh, People came to me, this, this, all, this all robes, they didn't see me. And they, who, they were relating with the robes. Uh, for a while, it was good for me because I'm shy and I don't like people getting too close. But over time, uh, the need for connection wasn't being met. I was not in a monastery per se where I would be able to have that sense of connection with my other monks. <laughs> they don't see me as some other, I'm one with them, but I'm living with people who see me as other and I don't want to be too close to them. And then the need for connection is not being met. And I didn't even know that I have a need for connection, but everyone has, that's what, that's what humans, if you're, if you're in a human body, part of that is it's, it's even biological a need for connection, whatever that, whatever, in whatever way you can, you can establish that. So I was not doing that. And the part of where you could say it's difficult for some other people because they've established connection, they want connection, doing what I was doing would be difficult for them, which is supposed to be what the monk is, the monk is supposed to be training a life of solid, of solitude. So being solitude in the midst of, I could be in the midst of thousands of people and I feel very at ease and very, very 
very much as if I'm in solitude. Uh, so the aspect of engaging society was easy for me to do. It was second nature. And everything, basically everything dealing with me connecting with others, not having to connect with others came easy for me. It was not a problem for me, which was some of the things that people say, oh, I can never be a monk because, because of, especially because of that. So, oh, I guess that's easy for me. But this very thing that was easy for me was also not allowing me to grow. Because these are things like um, it, not putting myself, you could say, within the temptation of sexuality, for example, is not giving me the opportunity to relate with it properly. Uh, so the barrier, the people who seem to be coming to me, calling me teacher, there's a distance and I can't, can't, I'm not really living their life. I mean, I go to work, I go to an office, I have bills, but I'm not really, really them. I'm like a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a intruder in their life, so to speak, because I am really in the monastery somehow. So the, the, the things that they're going with, the, the, the difficulties that they have with relating with, with friends, with, with uh, the kind of emotions that come up, I would tell them, you know, just like, uh, develop love, <laughs> as if that was an easy thing to do. Have patience, as if that was an easy thing to do. And I would tell them that because I don't really, could not really understand what they were going through. It was because of my distance. And if I was in a monastery, maybe the, the other monks would show me their anger, they would be angry with me, and I would say, oh yeah, when that happens, this is what you're supposed to be doing. That was, but I was, not, I was isolated. I isolated myself from these kinds of human interact, regular everyday human interactions. Uh, and as far as the other monks are concerned, as far as the lay people are concerned, when they see me as an example, oh my God, look at this exemplary monk. <laughs> he doesn't get angry. He doesn't get angry because he's not put in a situation <laughs> with other people to get angry. <laughs> He doesn't have to be, deal with things that normally would make people angry. So this one, he doesn't get angry. He's loving. Of course, he's loving. It's like that, uh, uh, I just saw a Korean movie uh, recently where the rich family, poor family, and the, and the poor family are saying, of course, they, they are happy. They're rich. <laughs> like when you have certain uh, conditions met, of course, uh, certain anxieties, just, you just don't live them. Of course, I, I appear to be content because I'm not dealing with things that normally people deal with that would make them un discontent. So I don't, so that I don't really have the tools per se. I have them in a theoretical way, but I don't have I don't have the practical tools per se. I didn't have the practical tools per se to uh, deal with actual live live situations, live, live difficulties. Uh, and I started to realize that. Um, and, and it was, uh, what was really difficult was the palpable sense of distance. I am here with someone and yet there is a distance that I feel. Uh, and people weren't, I feel like I wasn't, uh, people never actually related with me we were relating with, I'm not talking about uh, philosophy here, okay? They weren't dealing with me, they were dealing with an idea of who I'm supposed to be. And being, uh, <laughs> having this pathology of wanting to please others. So I put on the costume of being an ideal monk nicely, okay? Uh, but the, the person who's supposed to evolve, the person who's supposed to actually get to enlightenment, that person is not really evolving because it's just a facade walking through, walking through, 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 through society. So there is no growth going. Yes I, yes, I was able to recite the entire sadhana and I'm able to 
let's say, oh, that's not what Nagajuna meant. <laughs> I'm able to do that kind of stuff. But is, there, is the person in me actually growing? And the only way growing takes place is in actual relationships, in really relating with other people, someone. Um, the only way you can really say I've mastered anything, patience, uh, even celibacy, is in relationship to others. You could be on a planet all by yourself. There's no one there, and you and you're a lousy celibate. Okay. Um, so. And I realize a very important component on the path, as far as I'm concerned, for my growth, is I need to, um, my, my growth needs me to have direct relating with others. And since, and there are people, of course, there are people who are able to do it. They didn't have the predisposition of shyness that I did. Uh, I have built my robes to be a wall. And people related to me that way. So the, the way for me to really grow, to really get to, get to, ah, oh, I do have anger issues. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and now I can actually do something about it rather than, you know, having abstract ideas about anger and dealing with it. Uh, then, uh, after thinking about it for a very long time, over a year, uh, years, I would say, eventually the thought became stronger because the sense of distance became stronger, it became more unbearable, and I was getting older, and I wasn't really growing the way, I, the way I'm supposed to be growing. And I, I saw the robes as, okay, I have to give up the robes so that when people see me, they don't see robes and then deal with me. They would immediately see me and deal with me and maybe they say, oh, maybe he was a monk. <laughs> maybe that will come to be an afterthought. And now when they're dealing with me realistically, then I will have realistic, I will, that, begins, that will begin to train me to deal realistically with them also. And if there is, if compassion comes, it will not be the facade of compassion, it will be actual compassion because I've actually dealt with anger. So, um, and strangely enough, it wasn't until, and I mean, I've, I've not been a monk for, and again, the number of years escapes you, I don't know, it's been a long time. Uh, only recently that I start to dream about myself and not see myself as a monk. When I, dream of, when I dream of myself, I always dream myself as a monk in the monk settings. This has been such a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much, Punsok. Where can people find you? I know you've got many activities that you're doing teaching-wise. Actually, you're a Bodhisattva Academy, you have a Patreon, you have a YouTube channel, and lots of good stuff in all those places. And I'll include links to all that in the show notes so people can scroll down and click that. But what's the best place for people to go if they want to find out more about you and listen to some of your talks? You've got many of those online. Ah, oh, right. Uh, all these things <laughs> that you mentioned were started by a student of mine, here or there. Here and there. The, the YouTube was studied by a student the Patreon was studied by another student. All these online presence that I have were studied by students. And only now that I'm, I've said, oh, I should start taking some responsibility with those things. And I have, oh, my, my dear Liz is helping me with that. And she's, uh, she's uh, I think I studied something, I think I studied the, is it, what is it? Instagram. <laughs> I studied the Instagram account and I just posted a picture of a stump I found somewhere. And <laughs> I left. That's very, that's very Instagram. <laughs> You're doing it right. <laughs> now you can post your breakfast. Next yeah. you your breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the only thing I was doing with it. And then Liz came in and then now she's, uh, 
she's done tremendous things with it over the short period of time that she's been with it. Uh, so uh, I, don't, I wish I could give you, okay, these are the list of things where I can be found. I don't really know where they are. And there's a, and she's working with me now with, to have a web page, another web, the web page that I have, like you can see it's an archaic thing, also studied by a student and then abandoned, but somehow it's still up there to be seen. Um, so we're gonna start a web page where all these things will sort of like have a home. Mm. There's Patreon, there's uh, Instagram. And what I do live nowadays is uh, some, and this was a request, someone asked me, oh, can you, I, I, I would like to understand Buddhism. I said, oh, come over. And then they brought some friends and it became a class. <laughs> and it's, it's been going on for some years now and we call it home. And now it's every Thursday, we have a Zoom, Zoom, and that's where we do a meditation, we discuss, discuss a topic, people ask questions, people don't ask questions much, not much nowadays. <laughs> and then we close with a meditation. And once in a while, someone invites me to collaborate with them on, on a course somewhere. Yeah. So that's why I'm, uh, I wish I had those things ready so I can say, okay, no, it's okay. I will curate them uh, and I'll also talk to Liz and get those in the show notes. So actually, if you're interested, just uh, scroll down or indeed Google Tup Tum Punstock. It's an easy way also finding you. You're, you have a lot of good presences there. Well, Tup Tum Punstock, this has been so fantastic. Uh, thank you for sharing your life story and uh, your journey. So incredible. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm so honored that you took it here. And uh, I know you've interviewed very real big people and I don't know why you invited me so thank you <laughs> <laughs> thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast for more interviews like these as well as articles videos and guided meditations visit www.guruviking.com